Huh? Oh, woo! Oh, yeah, it's stunning, Ludo, but the technical advancements happening every day that are making these games so gorgeous have a nasty side effect for level designers like me. Yeah, so let's dive into why and how to fix that. Welcome to Design Bill. As the game industry has grown, the reach for realism has grown with it. Not just with realistic simulations of facial spasms or physics systems, but also with how realistic our environments appear. Densely populated, lush environments for our players to explore, and this type of environmental detail has never been easier to achieve. By using middleware such as World Machine, entire continents can be generated procedurally and then moulded to your liking. By using Speedtree, these valleys and empty canyons can be transformed into lush, dense forests at the click of a couple buttons, and these are used everywhere. Speedtree alone was used in a lot of your favourite games over the past few years, Elden Ring, Dragon's Dogma 2 or Forza Horizon 5. Dynamic lighting, volumetric fog, procedural generation and new AI tools are allowing environment artists to generate ever bigger and densely detailed scenes faster than ever before. Which is fantastic, as it allows us to fully immerse our players in believable environments and experience worlds and events that they couldn't in real life. The beauty of alien worlds and the horrors of decrepit eldritch bathrooms? You're not going to use the toilet. Actually, good choice. But this all raises a unique issue for level designers like me. So for anyone who is unaware of what I do outside of my work on Design Delve, I used to teach level and sound design at a university in England, but I also work on two indie games. One of them is under NDA, so we can't talk about that just yet, but the other is an underwater horror game called The Bog. Along with being the team's sound designer, I'm also one of their level designers. Now I need to quickly make the distinction between a level designer and an environment artist. A level designer, well, designs the levels. It's layout, flow and puzzles, with a focus on how to communicate to the player where to go, what to do and how to do it, all through the layout of the level itself. An environment artist's job is to take those designs and then make them work within the world visually. Now, there is a lot of crossover between these roles, but my main job is to teach and guide through play. Ludo, it's, it's this way. See, this is the fucking problem. We'll have to paint this entrance yellow or with a big fat arrow or something. See, because good level designs don't sell well in trailers, a lot of resources and time have been diverted to packing these levels with stuff. Modern games are so densely packed with foliage, broody lighting and volumetric fog, it's become increasingly difficult for our base teachings to shine through or even be noticeable at all. For example, it's a little difficult for us to use framing to guide the player when there are five trees a barrel and a glowing fucking pig sitting in the way. This is why we see a lot of the dreaded yellow paint or overcompensating with a million different UI elements so that at least something stands out in this sea of stuff. And I've experienced this kind of frustration firsthand. So we're about to start talking about my work on the bog, and I can't really show too much visually because of story spoilers, but I hope you can enjoy some of our concept art as I tell my little story. So we were in the process of finishing off our MVP, a small bite-sized chunk of the bog that is an example of it as a whole, and in the game you play as a tiny otter called Lino. Because of this, there is no dialogue, we also have no user interface, so a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of teaching is down to the level design. And I began by designing each section of the MVP to communicate a certain aspect of the game's narrative or its mechanics. So once everything was white boxed out, which is the bare bones version of the level with no art assets and a bunch of internal testing, we got to the point where it all worked together like clockwork. Which I was insanely proud of, because this game as a concept is probably the hardest level design challenge I could ever dream up, let alone work on. An underwater, escort mission stealth horror game attempted to teach everything to the player with no dialogue or UI. Oh god. Yeah, but as hard as it was to design, it's super fun to play. So with our white box levels completed, it was now time for our amazing artists to come through and turn our designs into a living, breathing world. And this process is incredibly rewarding. Watching our levels turn into these breathtaking environments is so satisfying and takes a whole team to realise. But it muddies the waters. Sometimes the art is so good that it distracts from what needs to be seen. Something left as a key aspect of the room gets lost behind the beauty. Attempting to make our water more realistic, densely packed with particulates and mud, adding complex backgrounds or foreground elements to give depth draws away from the actual play space and what needs to be seen to understand how to play. Taking these designs that we slaved over and hiding them because ironically, the artists are too good at their jobs, in turn ruining mine. 
yeah, I'm being a little bit dramatic, but fortunately, we rarely experience this on the box. We consistently work together with the artists at all stages to elevate both of our roles. If a beautiful environment is born, but it breaks the level design, then there's room to adjust on either side, changing the level or the art to accommodate one another, using diegetic visual elements to guide the player instead. Lighting or chiaroscuro can be used. The angle and animations of flowing plants and enemies can be used to elevate both the art, mood, and level design all at once, rather than allowing them to suffocate one another, and this is only possible possible because of how we communicate and test the game together as a team. And because of that, I want to thank my fantastic teammates at The Bog for being such wonderful people to work with, and we seriously can't wait to show all of you more of this game soon. But as much as we've gotten past this limitation within our own team, this is still a problem within the wider industry as a whole. Because level designers and environment artists in bigger AAA companies are kept segregated, along with other aspects of game development such as sound and systems engineers, and yeah, and doggy developers too, different priorities come down from different team leaders looking to keep their own individual jobs in this horrific climate of layoffs, clear communication between teams becomes so much harder to achieve when you have a bunch of office politics hoops to jump through first, and unfortunately, this has a drastic effect on the game as a whole. This is something I got to hear firsthand from so many industry friends at GDC this year, and it's so refreshing to hear that our story at Second Wind is inspiring many teams to go independent to escape their corporate overlords, giving power back to the people, and in turn, making better games because of it. I'm one of the lucky few to overcome this issue of games being too pretty, because the team I work with is so wonderful, but not everyone is as lucky, so don't be too quick to judge yellow paint or handhold a UI, because the landscape these developers might be navigating behind the scenes is less than ideal. <coughs> well, yeah, I know it's not the player's fault, but it's good to keep it in mind because we're all human too, come on. But what do you think? Has the game's visual clutter ever made it hard for you to even play the game? And have level designers forced attempts to try and fix this, like yellow paint, ever taken you out of the experience? Let us know down below, because we would love to discuss this with you. Ugh, well, actually, Ludo, I feel a lot better. That was like therapy for me. No, that doesn't make you a doctor in any way, shape, or form. You diagnose me with dickhead. You seriously push your luck sometimes, girl. Okay, say goodbye. All right, see you later, guys. If you have a hankering for the classic RPGs of the SNES era combined with a vibrant modern energy, then you need to check out My Familiar, the upcoming turn-based buddy cop RPG from developer Chinsey Inc. Things kick off when you're isekai from Texas into the strange streets of Wish City, where the townsfolk are monsters, corruption is king, and most importantly, you can see a buff duck punch a gangster sheep, which sounds like a secret code for something illegal. Explore the gorgeous pixel art world while you fight, flee, and aggressively wrap your way through dysfunctional demons in flashy, over-the-top, turn-based battles, all set to the dulcet tones of an excellent soundtrack. Head on over to my familiar Steam page, wishlist the game, and get your hands on the demo today.